Okay, what I am going to do is talk a bit about what I know or what I've learned about digital sound production using microcontrollers. Okay, so one of the links that they have in the Instructables uh, for, um, for the Hackerbox uh, Jambox 28 is a, um, an article on uh, the Make website that does an excellent job of explaining how to generate sound with an Arduino. And what I'm going to do is run through that article, providing um, audible and visual examples of all of the stuff that they do, and hopefully expand on a few of the things that I found a bit difficult to understand as I was reading through the article, and it took me a little while to actually um, uh, get those ideas solidified in my head. So I'm hoping that I can uh, help other people out by um, running through, the, uh, through this and creating a little video of it, and um, yeah, hopefully it's helpful. So let's get started. Let's um, go over some of the various ways that you can generate sound from a microcontroller. Say you've got a, um, a speaker and a speaker is an analog device. It takes a, a signal, some sort of um, waveform. It might be a simple sine wave or it might be more complex. But in any event, it's taking that signal and it this is a transducer, it converts this electrical signal into an audio signal. There's a couple of ways that you can get sound out of that um, speaker. Uh, well, we can also put a square wave in there. And we saw that um, uh, we produced out of one of the digital output pins, uh, let's call that D digital out from some sort of a microcontroller, if we produced a square wave, we could get some sort of a buzzing sound out of a speaker. Probably the simplest way of, of creating a sound. Now, looking at that square wave a little more closely, we said that it had a particular number of we would call cycles per second. Cycles per second, also known as hertz. Um, that's the uh, the unit for cycles per second, and that's and, and that's a measure or a the units of the frequency. So remember, waves have a couple of properties. They have something that's known as their wavelength, and that's the distance that the wave travels over um, uh, over the course of one wave. And then they also have something called the frequency, which would be the um, the number of waves per second. Or cycles per second, or frequency. So that's that's the wavelength, and that's the frequency. Just to get a couple of terms out of the way. Okay, and those are related um, by the speed of your wave in the particular medium that you're that you're using. So, for instance, electrons in copper, it's about the speed of light, more or less. Um, and so you can um, relate the frequency to the wavelength. The audible spectrum is from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz is what people usually say. 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second to about 20,000 um, cycles per second. 20 to 20k, roughly. Now, um, dogs can hear much below, beyond that, and teenagers can probably hear up to about 20 hertz. But as you get older, this the cutoff frequency for what you can actually hear um, starts to fall back and um, you know probably you're safe at you know even saying that 15 kilohertz is an effective um, boundary condition for for what you can actually hear. I'm not going to get into any audiophile mumbo jumbo about whether or not you can feel those signals up above 15 kilohertz. You can certainly feel the signals below 20 hertz. 
but whether or not it is something that you would call audible or not is another question but um, you can probably definitely feel them so those are the range of frequencies that we're we're talking about here so as you adjust your frequency of your square wave you are going to be adjusting your frequency uh, the the pitch sorry the pitch is what in music you call um, frequency there's another um, characteristic uh, that affects how we perceive sound and that's something that is called the timber or timbre, timber timbre, and the way, one way of visualizing that is the amount of energy that is being delivered as as you're generating your frequency, and the way you can you can you can get a an initial sense of that is let's take a look at this square wave a bit more closely. It's got the way I've drawn it here, I've got my um, my uh, period of time that it's sitting high as being equal to the period of time that it's sitting at low. So that's equal. That's also what we call a 50% duty cycle. So... The duty cycle refers to how much of the time is spent in the on state versus how much of time is spent in the off state. So if you've got a 10% duty cycle, you've got just these little spikes with most of the time being spent low. And if you had the same number of cycles per second, the frequency... If the frequency was identical between these two waves, which they aren't, it's not drawn that way, but if I drew them that way, um, imagine that they were matching up or, you know, okay, so let's do something that's more 50%. So now we've got, so we've got these matching up here. So now the frequency is the same, but they would sound different. This would sound thinner, and this one would sound fatter. So let's wire up a little circuit to see if we can hear the difference between a low duty cycle pulse train versus a versus a fifty percent duty cycle um, pulse train and. Um, get a get a bit of a sense of the timber because uh, I think we're all pretty much familiar with the what frequency and pitch are you know the low notes are have a have a low pitch and high notes have a high pitch um, and the high notes are represented by high frequencies and the low notes are represented by low low frequency so yeah let's um let's wire up a little Arduino circuit and look at the code and see what we can do about um, getting some um, audio intuition about timber Okay, so let's start a new project in Platformio, and we're going to give it a name on an Arduino Uno. The Arduino framework. Playing TCP. All right. So it doesn't get much more simple than this, other than putting, uh, and, well, you might not even need that because we're not doing any I.O. Um, <clears throat> analog write produces a um, pulse width modulated wave at 290 hertz or something like that. Anyways, with a duty cycle from zero to 255. Um, so the duty cycle can be um, zero, in which case it's putting out an analog zero, or 255, in which case it's putting out a full five volts. Then let's delay for 10 seconds and move to the next PWM width. So 10 milliseconds, 
add one, 10 milliseconds, add one, and so on and so forth until we get up to 255 and then drop back. So a sawtooth pattern like that. And that is what this program does. And that's what it looks like on the oscilloscope. You can see the duty cycle expanding, and then going back to zero, expanding, going back to zero, expanding. So instead of a, spe a speaker, we put an LED in there um, behind a resistor. We see that at the beginning of the um, of the um, of the loop, we get a, a a dim LED that slowly gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, and you can actually see it pulsing. So what your what we can see is um, the uh, the duty cycle getting higher and higher which means effectively the voltage that is being applied to that LED is getting higher and higher. Um, and the reason that we think of it that way is, well, uh, let's draw a few diagrams and we can, we can see why we can, um, we can think of it that way. I should probably give a trigger warning. Kind of almost calculus ahead. So, when that LED is receiving these little bits of juice in the, in the very early parts of that cycle, it's just getting little sips of energy. That LED is, is in effect, seeing a, a sum of these little bits of energy. And when it adds all of these little bits of energy up, that is the apparent voltage that it sees. So basically what we're doing is we're integrating all of these, adding, adding up, that's all integration is, is adding up little chunks of, of data, um, or summing if you want to. We're summing up over time all of these little pulses of data, P1, P2, P3, so we're adding all of those up over a particular unit of time, and that's giving us how much, essentially, voltage that the um, LED is seeing. So if you have longer pulses, that means these P's, well, or maybe call them Q's, Q2, Q3, Q4. Since these are bigger, the sum of over the length of time that we're considering of those Q are going to is going to be larger. So the sum of the P's, the sum of the Q's is going to be bigger than the sum of those P's. So the voltage that the LED sees effectively over a given unit of time is going to be larger. So the the voltage um, with P's is going to be less than the voltage with Q's. So pulse width modulation can be used to parent voltage that is being delivered in a, um, in a signal. Uh, P equals VI. So um, if the current is um, constant for these two, then the power is going to be greater as well. So you can think of it as a way of modulating the power of it. In any event, this gives us perhaps a way of making something that is a bit um, more pleasant to the ear, something like a smooth wave. And how are we going to do that? Or what, what are some approaches that we might take to try and, try and create that? Well, if this is... If we've got enough time, then we can actually adjust the pulse width that we're sending at a particular time and um, give more or less energy to our output, the amount of duty cycle. So if we have for low um, volumes a low duty cycle and for high volumes a high duty cycle, then we can do something like this. We can maybe digitize this signal like follows. 
So we just do something like this. So in this interval time t ti, we're going to have a duty cycle of, let's say, um, d sub i. And then in the next interval, we're going to have a duty cycle of d sub i plus 1, where d sub i plus 1 is bigger than d sub i. So as we go through this, we get our um, we get our different uh, voltage levels. Now, this is going to be pretty jagged unless we do some filtering. Essentially, this quantization that we're doing is high frequency relative to the um, signal that we're trying to um, digitize. So if we can use a low-pass filter to pass only the signal portion of this and filter out all of these jaggedies by um, filtering out the, the higher frequencies, so we use a low-pass filter, that will give us a smoother signal. 490 hertz, that isn't a lot of uh, frequency to work with because it's well inside our, our range of hearing. What we're trying to figure out is a way of um, modulating a signal so that we can repl modulating our pulse widths so that we can hear a signal that's on the order of 20 to 20 um, kilohertz. The good news is that inside an Arduino and many other microcontrollers, um, you can get a pulse width modulation signal that is about 62 kilohertz. And something tells me that um, that should be enough in order to digitize even th signals up into the 20 kilohertz range. I think you only have to be able to sample it two and a half times the frequency in order to be able to replicate a signal. I'm a bit sketchy on my Nyquist theorem, but that rings a bell. Anyway, 62 kilohertz ought to give us some uh, some headroom uh, to uh, to do some digitization and some pulse width modulation um, in order to digitize audio signals. But anyways, um, that that's what we can do. Now, the way you have to go about doing that is obviously you can't use the, the straight up um, pin mode. Pin mode is, and um, analog write are not going to cut it. So we have to find a different method because the analog write can only um, send out a pulse width modulation out of 490 um, uh, hertz. And so that's not going to be fast enough. But how do we get at these um, high frequency pulse, pulse width modulations out of an Arduino? We have to start using the um, some of the some of the AVR features that the Arduino is built on. And in particular, the things that we're going to use are something called the timers. Apparently, there are three timers, T0, T1, and T2. The, these two uh, are timer, timers have 8-bit resolution. T1 can operate with 16-bit resolution, but it also has an 8-bit mode. And the way they work is pretty straightforward. They count from 0 to 255, and then they go back down to 0 and then back down to zero. 
just like that. They also have a nice feature. Um, uh, you can set a register and that register, when the timer hits the, the value in that register, it will send a signal. And what you can do is you can, from that, generate a square wave. So once the timer starts, it's going to produce a voltage until it hits that trigger point, and then it'll drop to zero. And then it'll stay at zero until the timer starts to count again, and then it'll go back up until the trigger point hits, it goes back down, it'll go to zero, and then it'll go back up until the trigger point hits, and then it'll go back down to zero, and we have generated a square wave. These things operate at um, a at a much higher frequency than our analog write does, um, because we need a lot of processing power in order to get analog write working as seamlessly as it does and at a higher level. So there's lots of things that are going on inside the Arduino in order to make that happen. But in any event, this is the picture that we're trying to use here. We can create out of these timers, and these this time period here is very short, we can create a square wave of varying duty cycles by writing different values into a register and using that value to create different pulse trains of different duty cycles. So as you can see here, if I have this register value R2, that gives me this duty cycle here, which is, um, uh, what am I going to call this? Call this D2, D2, and that's this thing here. But then if I have this register value set, R1, then it's going to give me this longer duty cycle. See where I'm going with this? By adjusting these register values, we can get different duty cycles. Zero, T, C, N, T, one, and T, C, N, T, two. There, those are the name of the different um, timers. So these two, once again, eight bit timers, and that is a 16 bit timer, up to a 16 bit timer, but you can adjust the behavior of that timer by writing into things called the red called registers, configuration registers. Now, these registers here, they are called OCR. Well, each of these has an OCR. Um, and this is the, oh, what are they? What's the output compare register, I believe? So once the output of the timer hits the value in this register, it will trigger an interrupt. And so each of these um, timers, TCN, T0, 1, and 2, each have a register, the, the compare register, and then um, and they trigger an interrupt. So what we're going to do is um, write an interrupt handler that increments the value in this register. Okay, so let's just review that again. By updating values of our compare register, we can change the duty cycle of a pulse width modulated signal that's coming out of a particular Arduino pin. And we can do that very fast because it runs at 16 megahertz. So we've got lots of time in order to do all of this nonsense. Um, it turns out that the pulse width modulation that you can get is 62 kilohertz based on that 16 megahertz clock. Okay, so, and then remember that because of our summing or our integral thing, um, we are able to essentially output an analog value through, if we use some filtering, uh, we can output an analog voltage value 
depending on our depending on our duty cycle. So let's put those two ideas together. Duty cycle if it's fast enough can correspond to a change in voltage. Okay. And then if we modulate the duty cycle fast enough, so change the duty cycle fast enough, so we modulate the duty cycle, what that means we have a modulating change in voltage. And if we remember back to where we started all of this, when we had a, a change in voltage, 0, 1, 0, 1, we were vibrating our, here we are, here's our diagram. If we have a changing voltage, we are vibrating our speaker so that it's producing sound. So modulating the duty cycle is going to modulate our voltage, which means that we can modulate the, um, the sound. And if we can have a fixed frequency of our modulating duty cycle, so it modulates from zero to, um, to full duty back down to zero, um, if we can modulate that at a particular frequency, that means that we're going to get a particular frequency of sound out of our system. One more time. By using some magic of timers inside of our Arduino, we can have an adjustable duty cycle at any given point in time, and that corresponds to a particular voltage. So adjust the duty cycle, we're adjusting the voltage. If we modulate now, our adjusted duty cycle, what we're doing is we're going to be able to modulate the voltage and modulating the voltage is equal to producing sound. Now, there's one more little step here that I want to talk about. And that is, <clears throat> how do we tell our Arduino what the frequency of this modulation should be? Or what the, how we're going to modulate this duty cycle. How are we going to tell the Arduino what duty cycles to use at what time? And the way we do that is by, well, one of the ways is by creating something called a wave table. And what that is, is nothing more than, um, well, let's, let's write them out this way. That's nothing more than an array of values. And what we store in this array of values is the duty cycle at time t. So for example, if we wanted to do a sine wave, the duty cycle here should be close to zero. And if we want to have this voltage value at this time here, the duty cycle should be up around 100%. Oh, but what are we going to do about these negative values? You, can't have a neg you cannot have a negative duty cycle. So what you usually do is you shift up your your signal so that it's always fluctuating up and down ab above um, above your zero and then your duty cycle is actually producing that modulation and then you can subtract out your that um, offset voltage when you when you send it out the pin or not worry about it and just have uh, an offset um, fluctuation now I'm getting down into the weeds here a little bit. Speakers don't like necessarily to be um, uh, to be pushed out all of the time. They like to have be sitting around zero um, because you want to um, you reduce the stress on the cone. And if you have a constant um, applied voltage, the cone will be pushed out um, for 
uh, for all of the time and it'll vibrate up above its natural resting point but uh, i'm not too worried about that speaker but if you're gonna yeah you know yeah you know where i'm going with that anyways yeah so um that's what we're that's the goal of our next little um bit of work so let's say we want to create a sine wave so with that sine waves are based on uh, look something like that they go between um, uh, sine of theta because math this is theta along here and this is a pure number it goes from negative 1 up to 1 as sine goes from 0 degrees to 360 degrees but computers don't understand degrees um, mathematicians barely understand degrees the same sort of di diagram can be drawn using something called radians and one um, two pi radians equals 360 degrees just for conversion. So now, as we go from 0 to 2 pi radians, we're getting from going from 0 through 0 back to 0. Sine is still 1. And that's the picture that we're going to use in order to come up with our wave table. So, you can digitize this sine wave into as many different chunks as you want. Let's um, Let's um, work in an 8-bit world, so we're going to have 255 different um, digitizations, or di uh, samples, essentially, that we're going to take of this. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to create an array that has 255 values. So create an array that has from 0 to 255 values. And in each of those, we're going to store whatever the sign, uh, whatever, an integer value between, let's say, 0 all the way up to 255. We're going to store an, a, a positive short int in that value. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're going to have to scale this, this negative 1, all the way up to 1. We're going to have to scale that up to 100 and 27 so this is going to be uh, and then we're going to have to sh well sorry we want 255 values from here to here we want 255 values from here to here so this negative one is going to have is going to start out being um well if we shift this up by 127 what it looks like is more like this now right so now 0, 255, and this is 127. So we're shifting it up like that, sorry. So this is what we're going to be storing in our array up there. So in order to do that, so we have to convert. First of all, we've got to... If we're going to do this in a program, we're going to go i um, equals 0. Um, i is less than 255. i uh, plus plus. And then what do we have to do? We have to, first of all, um, get a float. And that's going to be equal to um, the sine of 2 pi. Okay, so i is going from 0 to 255. So 2 pi times are in degrees. So we have to convert from, we have to convert to radians and 0 degrees. So i over. 360 degrees in a circle. Oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. 
pi over 255 times 360. That was almost a mistake. Right. So this is the fraction of one full circle that we've accomplished as we're going through our loop. So and when i is 0, we're at 0. So that's 0 degrees, which is equal to 0 radians. When i is up at 255, that means we're at the far end of our loop. And that means we're almost at 360 degrees, so 2 pi times 360. Right. And then we're, what do we call this? We didn't actually give this a name, so let's call this wave. And that's what we're going to call our array. So then wave i is going to be equal to, convert that to an int, our value v, which is our, our float that we've calculated from here. So that's our loop for generating a table of values that represent duty cycle that we need in order to generate the voltage, right? We're creating a wavetable so that we can modulate the voltage. And the way we modulate the voltage is by modulating the, um, the duty cycle. So when we, we're going to have, we're going to be starting out with the duty cycle of um, 127 and it's going up to a duty cycle of 255 and then back down to a duty cycle of zero and then back up to a duty cycle of 127. Right, so now let's uh, take a look at, um, okay, so that's how you generate a, v a collection of values that represent what duty cycle you're going to try and send through a uh, send out of a, of a pin. The last step in all of this is how do we fit all of these things together now? There is a, another timer that we're going to use. And that timer is going to, um, it, it is going to count through our wavetable. And as it goes through that wavetable, it's going to load the values into our compare register. This timer, timer one, is running constantly. Timer two is also going to run constantly, and it's going to constantly update the values in timer one. Okay, there's one other th little tip or trick about the um, the timers that I, I didn't cover, and we're going to use that um, tip to um, adjust the frequency. And that is our timers... Remember, they all have this compare register that can be used to, um, to trigger events. So, if you've got nothing in your compare register, let's say it just counts all the way up to, from, to 255, from 0 to 255. But if you use your compare register, what happens is you end up with something like this. not quite drawn to scale, but you get the idea. So essentially, you have halved this 2 megahertz frequency. And this is the, this, the frequency that we're using here is the update frequency of our, um, of our wavetable. Because what we're going to do is we're going to, you can, sorry, let me back up a bit. If you have a, a this register here, and you've got this compare register, and it gets to um, matching the compare register, one of the things that you can do is you can reset your timer. You don't have to let it go all the way up here. You can reset it and set it back down to zero so that it t counts up again, and then it counts up again. So no matter, you can, you can do all sorts of things. You can make it sh as short as you want, all the way up to your maximum 2 megahertz. So you've got a way of modulating this frequency. Now, how does this? How is this going to translate into our um, into our output? Remember that we're trying to digitize something like a sine wave. 
So we have to update, this is, we have to update 256 values in our, um, our array, our, um, this is hard to explain. Another property of the timers that I didn't talk about previously is the fact that you can actually reset them when they hit their, um, when they hit their, uh, compare, the compare register value. So for example, if you have a compare register hit here, you can actually get the timer to reset and then count back up. Reset, count back up. Reset, count back up. Reset, count back up, etc. So what that means is you can now, by adjusting the value of this register here, your compare register, you can adjust this frequency. How many times this happens. Now, the full um, length of time that this register is going to be running is at 2 megahertz because we're using that pre as a prescaler. And so now let's try and correlate the this register to the frequency of our output signal. Because remember, we're triggering a change in our... We're triggering... We're triggering a change in the voltage based on this timer. Right? And then the other timer, timer 1, is going to be generating our 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 wave. So now, how do we correlate the value of this register to the wavelength of our original wave? And here's how that plays out. We've got to update a wave 256 times in order to get a single wavelength. Okay? So, we need, so 256 times means we have to figure out how long it's going to take for 256 of these intervals to have taken place in order, and that will give us the frequency that we're generating these at because say we're generating these at a particular frequency that means that we're going to be updating this wave um, 256 times um, in uh, we're going to take 256 of these steps in order to update this wave once and this is the wave that's going to be coming out of our of our pin so what does that mean that means that the um, timer 2 rate, which is the base rate of our timer, divided by um, our compare register value, and then all of that divided by our um, wavetable length, that's going to equal our frequency out. So, for example, 2 megahertz divided by, let's say, if we're using a half of 2 megahertz, so um, 128 is our compare register value times 256. That's going to equal approximately 61 hertz. Okay, so what if we use 256 for our second timer value? That means that we've got 2 megahertz divided by 256 times 256, and that's pro approximately equal to 30 hertz. So that's the lowest frequency that we can generate by having this at the highest value. If we want to generate higher frequencies, 2 megahertz over, let's say, 10 times 256, and that's going to be equal to, and if it was just 1, 2 megahertz, 
hertz divided by 256 is approximately 7. Well, <laughs> why did I even have to do that? 787,800 hertz or 7.8 kilohertz, which is getting up towards a, which is getting up towards where um, you're, it's going to be a, a hard, well, not a hard sound to hear, but it's, it's getting up there pretty high. It's getting up there pretty high. It's well above um, vocal range, I'm pretty sure. Anyways, so yeah, that is, that is in a nutshell, well, it's a pretty big nutshell, and that is how we're going to try and generate a sine wave using our Arduino. Okay, so let's run through the program that we've we've got set out here. The uh, first of all, we need Arduino.h because we're in Platformio. Um, we're going to use interrupts, so we need to include the interrupt library or interrupt headers. Since we're going to be multiplying by pi um, times two all the time, we can save ourselves a multiplication by doing it once in this define. We're going to scale the sine wave up 127. Uh, so the, the sine wave is going to go from negative 127 to positive 127. And we're going to offset that up by 128. So the result will be from 0 to 256. The wave, length of our wavetable is going to be 256. This is arbitrary. We could make it as long as we want if we wanted shorter samples, but um, we just have to figure out what the frequency would be relative to a different um, length. And then here is our defining our um, our storage for our waveform, our wavetable. So we set things up by populating the wavetable, and there's our um, our little. Um, uh, our loop that we we discussed earlier. So we're taking the sine and we're multiplying it by um, by the uh, the percentage of 360 that we've completed at the ith step. Another way of, of looking at it from 0 to 1 times the amplitude and that scales it up and then this is adding our offset. Now, setting, setting up timers. This is um, this is tricky to um, figure out what's going on, but it, once you get it, it's pretty simple. So inside of this interrupt.h are def definitions of these, and these are just a number. So this is going to be the number of the bit in this register. And let me pull up a data sheet. So for example, WGM10 is a name for bit 0 in TCCRA R1A register. So the TC timer control register 1, and there's a couple of registers that, that are used. This is register A, 1A, for, for um, uh, timer 1, register A. And then there's these different bits that have names that are defined in the header. So what you're doing is your so on reset, these things are all zero. So what you're doing here is you're taking one, and I'm going to shift that to the left by this number of bits. As it turns out, this is zero, so you're actually just shifting this, you're just putting this in bit one or bit zero. But um, irregardless, this pattern is something you're going to see over and over again. So, for example, in register 1A, we've got this, what is that, COM1A1. COM1A1 is going to be defined here. Uh, actually, it's probably going to be 4, so you shift that over four bits and then or it with whatever is already in register 1a and then you in register 1a shift 
uh, bit over to WGM10. WGM10, once again, it's zero, so that's really just putting the bit one in the zeroth bit of this register. And similarly, in the B version of this register, we're putting one in this position. So that's setting up timer one. And what these do is sets up full 16 megahertz prescaler, pin low when our um, our timer reaches our um, our compare register value. So it starts out with a um, a full. So it starts out at the beginning of its count cycle with a um, uh, with a high, and then when it hits the compare register, it drops low. And we use 8-bit fast PWM mode, and that's done by shifting a 1 into the uh, WGM10 bit of TCCRA1A register, and by shifting a 1 bit over to the over this many values, WGM12, into the TCCR1B register. That's how you set it up, and you get that from the data sheet. Now, let's set up timer 2. To set up timer 2, we want to divide by 8 this prescaler, and then you want to call an ISR, so you set a bit that will trigger an interrupt service routine when this timer reaches this value, OCR, our, uh, the timer 2's compare register value. And we are going to set the frequency of the generated wave by setting that timer register to 32. So 32, I forget what that's, what will that give us? So uh, let's. Uh, it's about 244 hertz is what we're going to get out of this. And then enable interrupts to generate the waveform. So when this timer hits, it's going to trigger an interrupt, and then we re-enable interrupts to generate the waveform. Everything is done in this interrupt service routine and um, through timers. Everything, nothing is happening in this loop. It's just going to run, it's not going to call any calls, but loop is going to get called over and over again still. It's just, it's got nothing to do. All of it's controlled by the timers. So the interrupt service routine is going to get triggered when this guy throws an interrupt. So once this gets um, triggered, it will, sorry, timer 2 will set this register when timer 2 hits its compare register value. So now we want to um, increment our, our timer 1, our timer 1 um, PWM compare value so that it will start changing our uh, PWM duty cycle. And remember, the PWM duty cycle is what controls our voltage. So as this timer triggers, we're going to change the voltage that's coming out of our pin, pin 9. And then we continue. Now, this routine takes a little bit of time to complete, so we need to start our timer at a different, start our timer um, at a, a, a little bit ahead to compensate for the runtime of this interrupt service routine. So I, actually we can't get down to um, 400 um, hertz, or seven, up to 700 hertz, it's going to be down around whatever that is. Um, so, so we'll only get up to 1.1 kilohertz. Um, not up to 7.8 or 8, 7.8, whatever it was. 1.1 kilohertz is all we can get up to because we've got it start our timer at 7. Our lowest value is 7 that we can effectively use. So, yeah, and that's what that code 
does. So we um, flash that to our chip and we can go take a look at what that is going to look like on our um, oscilloscope. Okay, and that's the sine wave we get. And we're looking at, is that probe at one, yeah, one, one X. So we are looking at about one volt per division. So we're looking at about a one volt peak to peak, uh, two and a bit volts peak to peak. And then in terms of frequency, we've got that the seconds per division is one millisecond. So, uh, okay, and then to convert um, wavelength to frequency, 1,000 milliseconds per cycle is equal to one hertz, and so, yeah, that, that's about 200. <laughs> 200 hertz. Like, duh. 1 over 5 is... Yeah, so <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, that is producing a sine wave from our Arduino through a simple smoothing filter that is um, passing low frequencies but um, attenuating high frequencies associated with the pulse width modulation. Okay, maybe a bit of review. Wavetable. Oh, sorry, yeah, wavetable sound generation. So what we did was we created a collection of values, 0 to 255, just because that we're digitizing it in a, um, in a array that's indexed by NIT. And in each of those positions in that wavetable, we stored a duty cycle. And that duty cycle controlled a PWM signal. So this duty cycle drives a PWM signal. And that PWM signal changing drives a changing voltage after we pass it through a low pass filter. So that smooths out our jumps between our different pulse width modulated um, signals and it produces a smooth voltage. So <clears throat> these store our digital values. and output a continuous sine wave. How did we do all of this? Well, we generate a duty cycle based on a timer. So this value, the values that we're storing in our wavetable change timer one. These values change timer one's um, compare register so that we've got something that looks like this happening for timer one, where the compare register triggers a state change for our square wave. So the lower the compare register value is, the shorter the duty cycle. So either you've got um, a long duty cycle or a short duty cycle depending on the value of this compare register. Now, how did we adjust this compare register? We adjusted this compare register by <clears throat> modulating a second timer, timer 2. And timer 2 was created by taking 
um, the 16 megahertz clock that the Arduino runs on. This is running at 16 megahertz. Took that 16 megahertz clock that the Arduino is running at, and we slow that down to only 2 megahertz. And then we create a sawtooth basically wave that looks like this and depending on the compare register to value we can adjust the frequency of this modulation so the formula for getting between this compare register and the output frequency is the frequency of our timer 2, which is 2 megahertz, divided by the value of our compare register 2 times the number of bits that we have to write in order to get a full wave. And that is 256. So what that says is that 2 megahertz divided by 256 is equal to compare register 2. So yeah, so now by if we wanted to, we could adjust this value dynamically in order to produce a changing sine wave. So if we could, uh, we just write write some code that adjusts the value of this um, register, and as the um, as the Arduino turns along, it will change the value of this, and we can modulate the frequency. So now, what you can do is you can produce arbitrary um, waveforms by frequency modulating through here. So we've actually got an FM generator. All of that is for another time the FM generator thing. So all of this really highlights to me anyways um, how much effort went into creating the Arduino framework so that it hides all of this kind of nonsense from you if in order to start out. Because really, remember, all we were doing at the beginning to get sounds out of this thing was um, relying on that 400 and uh, what it was, 429 or <clears throat> hertz signal and then adjusting the timbre. Well, all of this timer stuff goes into things like delay and um, in the calculation of things like millis. These functions in Arduino rely on making use of these timers in, in clever ways in order to um, execute your, your code. So all of this stuff is still happening underground. If you want to, all you have to do is use things like delay and millis, and you can all get all of these sort of timerly kinds of tricks. It's just that these take more um, CPU cycles, so you can't get as fast by using them, but you could still use them in a, in a, in a loop if your timing wasn't critical. But if you need time, critical timing, you can get right down to the hardware level of your Arduino. And it's one of the things that I think Arduino got really, really correct in, in uh, developing the ecosystem is that they hid so much of the complexity of, of working with microcontrollers, but enabled users to easily access some of the best features of them timing, um, being able to um, pulse width modulate easily on analog output signal, um, having digital inputs, all of those kinds of things, so that you could um, create meaningful, meaningful projects without getting into all kinds of things like figuring out what the various values of a register are, and then having to um, bit shift. Um, so anyways, they, they hit a lot of complexity. In, in order to um, make things um, easy for the user. And I think that's one of the things that they got really correct about um, Arduino. Anyways.
I think that um, is enough for now. Um, I hope that is helpful for some people. If you've got any questions, of course, uh, you can uh, leave them down in the doobly-doo. And if I've made some enormous error, or even small errors, uh, which I probably have, please um, point them out. Um, I'd be happy to try and uh, correct them and um, learn from uh, all of you. And uh, yeah, so there we go. Thanks a lot for watching. Again, I hope it was helpful, and um, we'll catch you later. Bye for now.